Hello, welcome. Uh, firstly, can I say a quick thank you to the staff at Heriot Watt University for the invitation to present today. It's a real privilege and pleasure to be part of this community, so thank you ever so much. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you sat here watching this presentation and you were here last year, you don't recognize me. Who on earth is this bloke? Tom Cox? Nope. Unless you speak to my mum, then I'm very special, aren't I? No, nobody special. I'm just somebody that's worked with escape rooms for the last five years in education. And I design escape rooms with one specific purpose in mind, to develop learners' creative problem-solving skills. So if that's of any interest to you, then you might get something out of this presentation. I taught for 16 years in the primary sector uh, where I stacked children on tables, as is my want. And I now work at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, and I have the second best job in the world. I don't get to teach children anymore. I just get to talk about teaching. And I'm part of the teacher education team here, helping to train our primary and secondary students. So what's today's presentation all about? I'm going to go over some of the doing detail that I engage with when I'm designing my escape room experiences. As I said previously, I'm very specific with the purpose of my escape rooms. They're not to practice mathematics. They're not to uh, recall the knowledge of historical facts. For me and in my work, I design escape rooms with the sole purpose to develop creative problem solving skills. If I could give you a bit of context to my work here then, uh, Wales has recently undergone a huge curriculum reform and as part of that, we now have four purposes to education. Our curriculum is to develop healthy, confident individuals, ambitious, capable learners, ethically informed citizens and enterprise Surprising creative contributors. And it's with this purpose in mind that for the last few years, I've been working with staff in schools, students here at the university to create different escape room experiences that develop the creative thinking and the specific problem solving skills that our new curriculum is asking for. My experiences are live. They're hands-on practical escape rooms that are portable that we take around different schools. Um, I'm a huge proponent of technology in education as well. And whenever I can implement and engage with technology like uh, um, virtual reality or augmented reality or immersive rooms, then I, I readily jump at that opportunity. So, if I could begin by asking you your opinion on my digger. Do you like my digger? What do you think? Look a bit closer. Can you see him? Can you see him? Just there. Here he is. This gentleman's name is Lou Berlin. And Lou Berlin is an artist. He's an urban camouflagist, and he literally paints himself into the environment. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to use Lou to help me describe and explain how I go about designing my escape room experiences. As you see this image here, Lou's painted himself into this library. And if you look at all the different elements of the library that he's had to think about and incorporate into the painting on himself. So he's had to look at that, that little dark bit on his knee. He's had to get the top of the stool and the top of his thigh. He's had to put a frame on his chest. Lots of different elements he had to consider. Well, that's exactly the same approach that I have when designing my escape rooms. I think about all of the different elements of creative problem solving 
that I want to foster, that I want to develop. And I then plan for them and create puzzles specifically designed to develop each of those elements. So, for example, uh, there are a few listed on the on the screen that you can see there. They range from divergent thinking to combinatory play to changing perspectives to risk taking. I don't have time to cover them all today, but what I will do is just talk about four of them. We'll explore how I plan for divergent thinking, overcoming something called functional fixedness, um, curiosity and challenging assumptions. So if I could start with divergent thinking, this is something that I'm sure you're all hugely aware of. It's when we start with a prompt, we start with a puzzle, we start with a problem, we start with an object. And from that, our learners engage in generating many possible solutions. This happens all the time in escape rooms, doesn't it? Whenever you put one a learner into one of your experiences, they'll naturally start to engage in this divergent thinking, this what if thinking. When they come across three bottles with numbers on the top, they'll start to think, what if I put them in order of smallest number to largest number? What if I pick them up and feel their weight and I put them in order from lightest to heaviest? What if this? What if? What if? And it's this divergent what if thinking that I'm really keen to develop in escape rooms, this ability to generate new ideas. Now, one of the biggest issues we all have with learners engaging in our escape rooms is this idea of be creative now, this on demand creativity. It's not easy to do. What I want to try and do in my escape rooms is help my learners develop the skills so when they are asked to be creative they have a number of skills and techniques to help them be so rather than just staring at a dot and hoping that an idea arrives i use something called scamper and it's um, bob ebele's mnemonic uh, for a collection of divergent thinking techniques and all i do is create specific puzzles in my rooms that use each of these techniques to solve them. So, for example, I'll have a I'll have a puzzle in my room that requires substitution thinking. I'll have a different puzzle in a room where combinatory thinking is required. There'll be a different puzzle where the learner will have to adapt something or modify something or distort it. There'll be a completely separate puzzle where a learner can only solve the, that problem by eliminating something or reversing something. So I'll, I'll use the scamper mnemonic as a guide for me to put different divergent thinking puzzles into my rooms. So let me give you some examples of uh, some of the puzzles and hopefully this will become a little bit clearer for you. So if we start with a prompt like a Japanese puzzle box here, when the learners pick up this box, the lid doesn't open. It seems to be locked, but there's no keyhole and they don't know how to open this box. So if they then start to engage in scamper thinking, they can start to generate different ideas of potential solutions to this problem. They may think about adaption. And they may think, OK, well, has this box been adapted in a certain way where the side might slide off instead of the lid sliding off? Or they may think about combining it with something. Maybe if I combine this box with a hammer and smash it, it will open. Yeah, and that will certainly solve that problem. Or potentially they may think about rearranging and reversing. And actually in this particular situation, this is the solution to this problem. The box doesn't open from the front. If you spin it round and reverse it, the hinges that look like a hinge are actually a false hinge and it will open in a reverse manner. So that reverse thinking is being developed at that point. If I give you another example of a puzzle in one of my rooms, 
learners will find a box of tissues that say use me and they'll find a whiteboard with lots of different numbers on them. Getting them to think about scamper, they start to generate different ideas. Substitute, do I need, can I substitute something here? Can I rearrange something here? What if I rearrange these numbers? What if I adapt something here? Oh, what if I eliminate something here? What if I use the tissue to eliminate some of the numbers? And actually, yes, that is the solution to this particular problem. Some of the numbers are written in permanent ink and they're not eliminated. Another example is when learners find a box and it's full of coins and they find a magnet. Now, would substitution thinking work here? Would adaption, if I, if I eliminate something, what could I eliminate to help me figure out what's going on here? This is combinatory thinking with a little bit of combinatory play. They'll come up with the idea, hopefully, to combine the magnet and the coins and some of the coins are magnetic. Now, just as a little aside here, as a little bit of advice, um, don't forget about the power of proximity when you're designing your escape rooms. What I mean by this is that the closer two objects are found together, the closer the association is made in the thinking of, of the problem solver. So when the whiteboard is found with the tissues, then the, the association is made. I've got to use the tissue with the whiteboard. If I find those tissues across the other side of the room, it's an awful lot harder for, for the learner to make a connection between that whiteboard and the tissues they find over there. The same with the magnet and the coins. If I find the magnet with the coins, then there's an association. It's a bit easier for them to make that combinatory play. But if I find a magnet across the other side of the room in another box, and it's all the way over there away from the coins, it's a lot harder for our individuals to make that connection between those two objects. So if you're looking to make your escape room experiences easier or harder, then this is one of the things, one of the, the strategies that you can employ. OK, if I could now talk about one of my most favorite things to put into escape rooms and something that I will always incorporate and it's this idea of putting objects to other purposes um, and if i could begin by introducing this with a uh, dunker's candle challenge uh, maybe you've come across this before if you haven't play along with me what i'd like you to do is think about having a box of pins a candle and a box of matches and Dunker asks us in this very famous creativity test, can you use the objects that you have there to attach the candle to a wall in such a way that when the candle is lit, wax will not drip onto the floor? Pause the video, have a go. See if you can draw it um, and think about your ideas. How would you go about this problem? How could you fix that candle to a wall in such a way that when you lit it, the wax wouldn't drip on the floor? So how did you get on? Did you come up with some solutions? And if you did, did any of your solutions involve looking at the box of pins, then tipping the pins out and using the box in a different way? actually using a box as a shelf. In order to be successful with this problem, you needed to overcome your tendency for functional fixedness. And in a nutshell, it's just using objects in a new way to solve a problem. And this is something that I always put into my escape rooms. So for example, learners will find a key. And literally on the key, it says, I can open more than locks. They'll use the key to open up a lock. And then later on in the experience, there's a plug which they need to open to put a fuse in to turn some lights on. There is no screwdriver in the room. And eventually, when they overcome their functional fixedness about the key, 
they discover that the key can be used as a screwdriver and the object can be used in a different way and we can solve the problem. I consider this so important that I actually design whole escape room experiences where this is the sole purpose, where this is the sole aim of the experience, not to escape the room, but in this instance, to complete a famous artist's artwork. They have to use objects to complete the painting. So you can see here that a, a comb is being used as a, a grill of a car. In the same room, a pin, a hairpin is being used in a different way. It's a flute for a girl. They'll find a key, and that key doesn't open anything in the room. That key actually is to be used in a completely different way, and it's the head of a penguin. And what I love about this is that even though I design puzzles and problems to overcome functional fixedness like this, where two spoons are meant to be used to um, to give me eyes and antennae of an alien that that learners will come up with their own solutions in a very divergent way. They'll use the magnets they found earlier and they'll use them in that way. Or I've designed this this problem where a pair of pliers have to be used to complete this picture of a cowboy. But actually in the room, they'll take one of the hasps off one of the boxes where I had multiple locks and they'll use that. And I love this. I love the fact that, that the learners are coming up with other possible correct solutions. I love that creative thinking. And that's what we're going for. There's a beautiful example here of a, an escape room that I did recently with a group of uh, year fives in a school where they were completing the artwork as I intended and they were solving the puzzles as I thought they would until this gentleman on the right took off his pair of glasses. And even though they'd already completed this puzzle and they'd used the corkscrew for the body of a robber, he took his glasses off and he made his glasses the legs of the robber. I just thought it was a beautiful example of this type of creative thinking. So here we have another example of a puzzle in one of my escape rooms. These two learners are trying to make this hoverboard work. They're trying to connect that circular hoverboard on the floor to the hoover on the right hand side to make it lift up. After using different objects to try and connect it, they eventually start to go inside the space shuttle that's there and they take this piece of ducting. They find this piece of pipe and they start to connect this. Now, this nearly works. This is a solution that you would think, oh, that's that's going to work. It doesn't quite work. And here's the reason why. I plan my escape rooms like I'm teaching judo. When you first teach judo, you don't teach somebody who just a beginner how to throw somebody on the floor. What you first teach them is how to fall without hurting themselves, how to fail successfully, how to be thrown and not get hurt. Well, in the same way with escape rooms, it's no accident that that piping was there. I plan for both failure and success. And I plan that children fail, but fail forward so that they use their knowledge of what just happened. They think, oh, I was nearly right. I'm going to keep going. And in fact, I reward children for successful failures. And I'll use language like, you know, that's a really good solution. It's just the, not the solution for that particular problem. So with this in mind, they'll get an understanding that, okay, this piping nearly worked. We need to go and find some more piping. And eventually they go back into this, into the, the space capsule. They'll see that piping that's hanging above that girl's head on the top left-hand corner picture there. They take that apart, they connect it. And as you can see, bottom right-hand corner, that that works and the hoverboard um, becomes active and they can solve the next problem. If I could then quickly talk about um, another important aspect that I always plan for, and that's for curiosity. And for me, it's hugely important that learners 
find things in the room and have success and are rewarded for just being curious, not solving a problem, but just taking the time to be curious about objects and to look where others may not look. So, for example, uh, in this escape room, they lift up a candle, they find a key. If they walk over a, a, a mat on the floor, I want to reward those curious students that if they what if they look underneath it, what might they find? And here they find a code and numbers. They open up a box, find three batteries. Rather than just picking the batteries up and looking around the room for where the batteries go, but being curious with something that actually they think they already know about. And if you look at that that top battery, you can see there's something slightly off about it. And with a little bit more curiosity, they find a key. The same with a bottle. They may find an empty bottle in one of my escape rooms. So why be curious? I can see inside the bottle. I can see that there's nothing in there. I don't need to be curious about this bottle anymore, but I want to reward those that do show that additional curiosity. They take the cork out and underneath there's a little capsule with a code on the inside. It's very easy to be curious with an object when you find it in isolation. So, for example, if you find a pot with a cork in it, it's very easy just to open up the cork, find a little key on the inside. So what I do and I plan for in order to make people really develop their use of curiosity, I'll put objects inside other puzzles that they need to be curious about. So, for example, that pot that had the key in it actually belongs elsewhere in the room and is part of an ongoing puzzle. And when they find that pot, they quickly run over to this, this shelf and they put the pot in place because they knew, oh, this is where it goes. It matches the silhouette and it goes in this place. I want them to be curious about everything, even if they're being distracted with they know where it goes elsewhere in the room. So I'd like to move to the final part of my presentation and ask you this question. If you were in one of my escape rooms and you saw this safe, what would you need to open it? Hold on to that thought for a moment. We'll come back to that in a second. For me, challenging assumptions is a huge part of an escape room experience, especially when I'm trying to develop certain elements of creative problem solving. And dropping assumptions and challenging assumptions is a hugely important skill to develop. Let's go back to the safe. What was your assumption here? Did you assume that you needed to turn the key? Maybe you assumed you needed a different key. Maybe you assumed that the lock was already open. You could just open it. Maybe you assumed that you needed a four digit code to put in to this safe in order to open it. Did any of you consider that actually looking behind the safe, there may be a hole in it? Did you assume that you just had to go into the safe from the front? In order to help develop this challenging of assumptions, I use this particular resource and I'll just share it with you. This is a beautiful jigsaw puzzle that I put into escape rooms and I use with learners actually outside of escape rooms as well to help them develop their ability to challenge assumptions. We all know how to solve jigsaw pieces, jigsaw puzzles. It's we, we've done it ever since we were young. So it's no surprise when I give this jigsaw to certain students in, in the university, they'll attempt it by using their assumptions about jigsaws. The problem is with this type of jigsaw, using assumptions of previous experiences with jigsaws won't work. And the children on the right hand side are already starting to challenge the assumption of what they know about jigsaws. And they they put parts of the jigsaw in this beautiful wiggly line across the table. They're already starting to challenge their assumptions about what they know about jigsaws. Now, what's this lady here doing? She's doing what we would all do. All of the pieces 
are turned the right way up and she's put the corner pieces in the corner. That's what she assumed would work from her previous experiences. This group, however, a little bit further down the line, have challenged those assumptions. The first thing they've challenged is, do I need to have all of the pieces the right way up? Or could it work if I turn some of them the other way up? Also, they've challenged the assumption that the corner pieces don't actually go into the corners. And it's this challenging of assumptions that can, at times, lead us to successful problem solving. So with this in mind, I plan for this in my escape rooms as well. What's the assumption here? It's a blue padlock. So I'm assuming that I'm going to need a blue key to open it. So when I find a green key, can I use it? Should I use it? Shall I try it? I'm assuming a green key won't work, but actually the green key does work on a blue lock. In the same way, when I find this padlock on a box, I'm assuming that my key goes into the keyhole. And when it doesn't work, can I challenge my assumptions? Could there be something else going on here? Can I use the key in a different way? Overcome my functional fixedness, use the key in a different way. And if I do, maybe I'll discover something. Oh, actually, there's another hidden lock. We can't always assume that what we see and the way we normally go about things will always work when we're solving problems. And so I plan for this and I build this into every single escape room. So to summarize then, how do I develop creativity and creative problem solving skills in my escape rooms? Well, I always include puzzles where learners must engage in divergent thinking, that what if thinking. I include puzzles where learners must overcome functional fixedness and use objects in a different way. I plan for learners to use their curiosity and to find things. And I make learners challenge their assumptions. I plan puzzles where that's essential that they do so. Thank you ever so much for taking the time to listen to my presentation. I hope you found parts of it interesting and a little bit helpful at times. If you want to know more or you want to continue the conversation with me or get in contact about anything that I've said or work with me in the future, um, I'd be delighted if you made contact uh, and my details are on the screen there. Thank you ever so much.